Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is White Waste and Structural Clay Products. In the previous class, we started discussions on ceramic industries. Then we had a, a brief introduction about uh, uh, ceramic industries, what were their conventional traditional names like uh, uh, clay products, etc., or silicate industry. Uh, etc. These, these kind of titles were there for uh, you know uh, ceramic industries uh, traditionally, but however you know uh, uh, modern products uh, designs have been developed you know for that you know uh, collaboration of ceramic industries with uh, metallurgical industries have been taken place and then uh, uh, some amount of uh, information from physical science have also been uh, coming into the picture for ceramic industries. So then because of that reason, calling these industries as ceramic industries uh, is inappropriate. And then coming to the products point of view, uh, what you see uh, in a uh, ceramic product is primarily how much is it thermally stable, how much it is uh, mechanically stable, how much it is chemically stable, right? what are the electrical properties, etc., those kind of things, uh, you know, one has to look into the properties if you are selecting a product as per your requirements. Or these are the primarily requirements of any ceramic products that they should be thermally, mechanical and chemically stable and then electrical properties should also as per the requirements, okay. So then these uh, products have been developed by different types of raw materials, but uh, Three of these uh, raw materials are essential and then almost common in almost all ceramic products. They are nothing but uh, clays and then feldspars and then sand or flint, okay. So clays, different types of clays are there and then uh, what are their uh, properties, etc., those kind of things we have seen. So, uh, and then we have also seen some kind of phase diagrams for these uh, clays so that to realize you know how that information may be utilized for the ceramic industry point of view. So when we had discussed Al2O3 SiO2 uh, phase diagram then we have seen that molite uh, is one of the refractory that, that can be produced by the combination of this material or white composition range uh, even when the temperature is less than 950 to 1000 degrees centigrade that is what we have seen. So then this has led to uh, you know, uh, revolutions in refractive industries that is what we have seen. And then out of the clays, kaolinite is one of the uh, most common one, but there are other uh, clays as well. So these things we have seen. Then you know, these uh, uh, ceramic products are usually produced when these uh, raw materials are uh, mixed and then uh, treated at high temperatures. So when uh, they are under high temperature applied conditions then definitely chemical reactions takes place. So then what are those uh, ceramic uh, chemistry, etc., those kind of things we have seen. In addition to that one, we have also seen the raw materials, not only these uh, three raw materials, there are several uh, other ingredients are also there like uh, fluxing agents and then uh, refractory materials, etc. These kind of things are there. These fluxing agents, what they do, they reduce the reaction temperature or uh, vitrification temperature, etc. For those purpose, these are uh, used. Not only for that purpose, for the binding purpose also, these they are used. Why binding purpose? Because these fluxing agents usually get fused if you heat them beyond the 950 or 1000 degrees centigrade. So then, when they are fused, so then they will. Uh, keep the materials binded together, whatever the mixture material is there that would be kept binded because of this fused flexing agents. That is the another advantage of this having flexing agents. Refractories they provide uh, required thermal and mechanical and chemical stabilities, etc. Those things uh, we have seen in the previous lecture, right. So then uh, we have also then uh, the classification of uh, ceramic products. Then we have seen different types of uh, products are possible or groups are possible like uh, white wares, uh, structural clay products, then uh, uh, refractories, 
then uh, specialized clay products, then enamels or enameled metals etc. these kind of products classification we have seen. Now in this lecture what we are going to do? We are going to start discussion on manufacturing processes of these you know different types of uh, ceramic products. Okay? So let us start with the uh, uh, production of white wares. Now we start discussing about the white wares. Right? So uh, ceramic products which are white and of fine texture are commonly referred to as white wares. So most of these products are mostly white in color, so that is the reason they are known as the white wares. There may be uh, fine textures etc. are also possible, but despite of that one they are called as white wares because primarily they are white in color. These are obtained by selected grades of clay bonded together with varying amounts of fluxes and then heated to moderately high temperatures of 1200 to 1500 degrees centigrade in kiln. So now when you have a different uh, grades of clay, so then you are also having different amounts of fluxes and then you are heating it a uh, wide range of temperatures as well. It is not a narrow range of temperature, wide range of temperature. So depending on the composition and or uh, proportions, properties of fluxes, or composition of these fluxes along with the temperature, they will lead to certain degree of vitrification. Right? So based on the degree of vitrification and then composition and then applied temperature, these uh, white wares may be further classified into uh, several uh, different types. Right? So they are earthenware, china ware, porcelain, sanitary ware, stoneware, and then whiteware tiles. So primarily these classifications have been done, you know, what is the degree of vitrification and then amount of uh, fluxes, properties of fluxes are also playing role in this uh, degree of vitrification. So in addition to that one, glazing all is also taking place. What is the uh, glazing and then what is the applied temperature to get the required uh, vitrification or glazing and then what is the uh, resistance to abrasion. Based on these characteristics, these uh, classifications of white waves have been done. So now what we do? We see a few details of uh, degrees of vitrification, glazing and then you know abrasion resistant to the abrasion etc. for each of these products before going to the production of uh, these types of white waste. Obviously we cannot uh, go into the details of production of each and every of this, uh, uh, these types of uh, white waste, but what we do? We take a porcelain material and then try to find out how these porcelain, how these uh, porcelain white waste are manufactured industrially. So now degree of vitrification and then resistance to the abrasion and glaze etc. those kind of properties, how are they varying for each of these white wares? Now we will see. Okay? So let us start with earthenware. They are also known as semi-vitreous linearware. They are not completely vitreous, semi-vitreous. If you are saying they are uh, semi-vitreous, so then obviously the applied temperature would not be high, would not even be moderately high. Okay? So these are uh, porous and non-translucent. Right? So they are obviously they are not completely vitreous, so then obviously they will not be translucent as well. In the sense what happens, you know, the material will able to pass the light, but uh, that light would be diffused. Because of that diffused light, you know, the objects other side of the, uh, these, uh, these products, you know, they will be, you can realize that there are some objects, some persons other side of this product, but you cannot identify clearly. Okay? They are also gaze, softly gazed. Okay? Uh, glazing is nothing but you know coating, coating uh, material with some kind of uh, glass, right? So that is you know that that will provide some kind of you know uh, glassy uh, appearance look look to the products. So most of the uh, ceramic products nowadays, if you see, they are you know initially they are very looking like you know very shiny, glassy kind of thing. That is because a thin layer of uh, glass is coated on the products that is nothing but uh, glazing. And then when you do this glazing, one has to make sure that is properly binding with the product. Right? When you do this uh, glazing, this, uh, this should be properly 
bonded with the product, ceramic product, uh, whatever final ceramic product, tile or tableware, dinnerware, etc., whatever you are going to have. So, this is possible, you know, uh, material that you are uh, selecting uh, for uh, glazing that should be have thermal expansion coefficient close to material, then only that will stick because after applying this glazing what you are doing, you are going to do firing at high temperature in kilns. So, when you do the firing at that high temperature, so vitrification of product will be taking place and then calcining of the product will also be taking place. So, during that uh, uh, firing period, if it is not properly bonded with the product, then what happens? Some kind of shrinkage, shivering of uh, things may take place and then surface will not be smooth enough. Okay? Next one is the china wear. These are vitrified translucent. Okay? So, uh, you can see other side of the um, product, you know, some kind of objects or persons are there that you can realize, but you cannot identify because they are translucent. So, that means that will allow the light to pass through, but that light will be diffused. If the light would be diffused, uh, you cannot identify the objects of the other side of the uh, this china wear products. Okay? So, they are vitrified, but translucent. Okay? And then glaze is medium glaze, which resist abrasion to a certain degree only. It, it cannot uh, resist abrasion to a larger degree, but to some extent, to some degree it can resist. It is used for non-technical purposes because it is translucent and then it can assist abrasion only to a certain degree only. Next one is the porcelain, right? So, it is vitrified translucent vitrified translucent as uh, china ware, but it is with hard glaze. Since the glaze is hard, it can resist abrasion to the maximum degree. Okay? So, what you can see? The presentation of this classification of white wares also in a sequence. In a sequence in the sense, earthenware are semi vitreous, but china ware and porcelain are uh, vitrified uh, material. Earthenware is non-translucent. Uh, whereas these china ware and then uh, porcelain are, uh, you know, tra translucent. Okay, and then glaze also. Uh, earthenware is having soft glaze, whereas the china ware is having the medium glaze, whereas the porcelain is having the hard glaze. So if the degree of glazing is increasing, so then resistance to the abrasion will also increase. So that is how they are pr produced. So then. You know, nowadays mostly white wares are porcelain type of white wares. It includes chemical, insulating and dental porcelain as well. Next one is sanitary ware. Formerly these are made from clay, so when they are made from the clay, obviously it is possible they are porous. But if the sanitary ware, if they are porous, so then it is not good because seepage of a sanitary waste may be gone into the sanitary ware. So, then that will uh, destroy or you know uh, lessen the strength of the sanitary wear, uh, sanitary wear over the period of time. So, then because of that one, you know, people started having a vitreous composition in the sanitary wear at present. Okay? So, that once you have the vitrification done, so what happens, you know, almost non-porous layer kind of thing forms on the surface of the product. Okay? Pre-fired and sized vitreous grog is sometimes included with uh, triaxial compositions also if required. Next one is the stoneware. It is one of the oldest ceramic ware and then it was uh, used long before porcelain was developed. In fact, the stoneware may be said as a kind of a unprocessed porcelain or incomplete porcelain or imperfect porcelain kind of title may be given to the stoneware because, you know, uh, it is not carefully fabricated from raw materials of a poorer grade, right? So, that is the reason they are also known as the crude porcelain, okay? Then whiteware tiles. So, these are available in number of uh, special types which include, you know, floor tiles, etc. Okay. So, these are commonly classified as floor tile which are resistant to abrasion and impervious to stain penetration and may, may be glazed or unglazed. Okay. 
these have a hard permanent surface and come in variety of colors and textures as well. Now we discuss about the manufacturing of porcelain. Three types of production methods are possible for the manufacturing of porcelain, one of which is wet process or wet process porcelain. It used for production of fine grained highly glazed insulators for high voltage service purpose. Second one is the dry process porcelain. It is employed for rapid production of more open textured low voltage pieces. Whereas third one is cast porcelain. If you, if your pieces are the material that you are going to produce, if they are too large or too intricate to prepare by these two methods, then cast porcelain method is used. Okay? All these methods are based on the same raw materials actually. But however, then why the differences are coming? These differences in these three processes are coming based on the method of drying and then forming steps. Forming in the sense, shapes formation. Right? You have moldable uh, ceramic uh, clay mixture, then you have to form a structure of as per your requirement, whether are you making a cup, are you making a plate, saucer, or are you making some other kind of uh, tiles, etc. So then they have to be the moldable or workable uh, clay plastic whatever is there that should be you know, formed in that particular structure, then it will be dried and then uh, you know, vitrification would be done. Okay? Now we see one of the processes that is wet process we see for the porcelain production. Let us start with a flow sheet for this process. Here uh, the raw materials are clays, feldspar and then flint. Out of the clays for the porcelain, china clay and ball clay are used. They are uh, taken to a hopper bins. Actually here only one hopper is shown but they are taken in different individual hoppers. right? And then as per the proportions or uh, compositions, these are weighed and then taken to the weigh car. Then they will be taken to a blunger. Blunger is nothing but a kind of a mixer which mixes the clay mixture plus water. So to this blunger, water is provided. Right? So, as we have already discussed uh, in the previous lecture, you know, uh, these uh, raw materials mostly they are wet or damp. When they are wet or damp, what happens? They form flocculate, flocculations may take place or agglomeration uh, uh, may take place. Right? So, these things should be avoided. So, for that purpose, this mixing or uh, you know, processing in ball mills or pebble mills, etc., are being done, or even agitation is also done. Right? So, after that also there may be some kind of flocks or you know bigger kind of uh, you know material would be there, uh, may not be suitable for production of uh, you know uh, uh, required ceramic product. Right? So, then they have to be removed. For that purpose you know what you do? This uh, slurry whatever coming from the uh, blunger that will be passed through a screen followed by a magnetic separator. The screens will remove the bigger size uh, lumps, etc. Right? This magnetic separator will remove the material which are having magnetic properties, if at all uh, they are present in the raw material. In the raw material, let us say iron oxides, etc. are there. They may not be you know, uh, impurities uh, for other industries, but they are impurities for this ceramic industry, the, so they should be removed. So that for, for those purposes, these magnetic separators are also utilized. So once removing these uh, bigger lumps, etc., in, and then magnetic materials, etc., this slurry is stored in a storage. So this itself directly may be taken for a, you know, shape formation in molds, or you know, they can be passed through a uh, pressure filter where most of the waste water is removed, or most of the water from the slurry is removed, and then discarded that water as waste water. Whereas the wet cake, whatever is there, that wet cake is taken to a pug mill. This pug mill is also provided with a vacuum and then it is also having slicing knives also. So this pug mill is again like a cylindrical vessel in which you know 
to which a vacuum is provided and then slice and then knives are also there. So when this uh, cylinder rotates, this mill rotates, the slides will move in a one particular direction and then that uh, impact or cutting impact would be provided on the materials. This will make the slurry much more uniform or wet cake whatever coming out from the filter uh, pressure filter you know, that will become much more uniform. Right? In this process you know in the wet cake voids would be there definitely. We know that this void percentage in, the, in general cakes that are coming out from the uh, filtration process is very high up to uh, 30 40 percent. So, if that much voids are there, the strength of material would decrease, right? Also, uniformity will not be there. So, uh, in order to improve the uniformity and then improve the strength of the material or the final product that is coming, so these voids has to be removed. For that purpose, vacuum is applied so that to do de airing. So, this vacuum will be used for de airing purpose so that you know voids would be reduced and then material will become you know a uniform and then product prepared using that in, uh, material would be you know having a good strength. So this wet cake after de-airing and then uh, further making uniform in this pug mill you know that material would be taken into blanks in hydraulic press or by hot pressing and then after that those uh, material would be dried in a dryer followed by trimming if at all required that trimming will be done and then they will be they will be further dried further dried uh, in another dryer and then by this time whatever the product is there you know almost like you know uh, uh, in a good condition only thing that you need to do is glazing and then firing at high temperature so that product whatever the plates saucers etc or any tiles etc that are coming out of this dryer they will be glazed they will be glazed in a glazer right so how they will be glazed they will be a glazing is nothing but uh, some kind of glassy coating using a uh, you know glass uh, material right so then once you do this uh, glassy coating that is nothing but uh, glazing that material would be taken to kiln where they are fired so that to required vitrification can be done once the material uh, have been uh, vitrified that would be tested for its electrical properties etc. Inspection would be done if the product is found to be good then that product would be taken to a you know a storage tank, storage vessel or for subsequent consumer required they will be transported. So whatever we have uh, uh, discussed in the flow chart same thing will be having a recapitulation here as a text. Raw materials of proper proportions and properties to furnish porcelain of desired quality are weighed from overhead hoppers into the weighing car. Felspar, clays and flint are mixed with water in blunger and then passed over a magnetic separator screened and stored. Most of the water is removed in the filter press and then water is uh, discarded as waste water. All the air is taken out in the pug mill assisted by a vacuum and by slicing knives this results denser more uniform and stronger porcelain prepared porcelain clay is formed into blanks in a hydraulic press or by hot pressing in suitable molds blanks are preliminary dried trimmed and then finally completely dried but all under carefully controlled conditions. So for these uh, operations you know temperature has to be properly controlled. What should be the temperature in the primary dryer? How the uh, trimming has been done? What should be the temperature in the final dryer? So all these things are carefully controlled otherwise you know uh, when you do the improper or very rapid drying you know uh, the shape deformation may take place. Similarly, trimming if you are doing uh, inefficiently, so then breaking or you know uh, or destroying the edges of the products may be taking place. Okay? So these operations should be done very carefully under controlled conditions. Then after that a high surface luster is secured by glazing with selected materials. Vitrification of body as well as the glaze, body in the sense whatever the ceramic product you are preparing let us say you are preparing a cup so that is a cup here or mug so that would be body is the mug that mug would be glazed and then glazing is carried out in tunnel kilns with exact control of temperature and movement 
Porcelain articles are protected by being placed in saggers, in saggers which are nothing but supporters fitted one on top of the other in cars. This represents a one fire process wherein body and glaze are fired simultaneously. Porcelain pieces are rigidly tested electrically and inspected. Right? So, that is how porcelain manufactured now, but much of the tableware is manufactured by more complicated processes than what we have seen in the flow chart. Okay? Some objects are shaped by throwing on potter's wheel where skilled hands work the revolving plastic clay into desired form. This plastic clay in the sense whatever the mixture of uh, clay, feldspar and then sand etc. along with the water after uniformity or you know required agitation etc. removing waste water etc. Once everything is done whatever the clay that you are having that is a workable or moldable clay or plastic clay that is what it is. So, here what happens in this pressure the uh, you know objects are shaped by being thrown on the potter's wheels where skilled hands work the revolving plastic clay into desired form as per the product structure. Some objects are cast from the clay slip in molds of absorbent plaster of Paris. After drying they are removed and further processed. Complex shapes such as artware and laboratory wear can be produced by this method as well that is clay slip method. Forming process flowchart is shown in the next slide. So, these are the like you know whatever we discussed, we discussed about the you know porcelain manufacturing, but forming is very much important because forming by forming method you give a proper shape to the object which is going to be your final object after uh, required glazing and vitrification. So, the forming is very important step. So, then we are going to see how the forming is done in general. So, forming process here we talk about jiggering of dinner plates. Now, flow sheet here if you see up to getting a slurry wet filter cake the process is similar whatever we have seen in previous steps, but however we have the details here. So, the uh, clays, flint and feldspars are taken as per the proportions required or as per the composition into a blunger to which water is also provided. The blunger is nothing but a kind of mixer. So, here thorough mixing of uh, these raw materials along with water would be done. If required to have some fluxes they will also be added. So, after the blunger the slurry is taken to a agitator where further agitation is taken place so that to make slurry as much uniform as possible without having any flocculants because here in this case we are not adding any flocculants as of now. Right, flocculants are being added, you know, in the uh, porcelain manufacture and then other purposes. Okay, so uh, the slurry coming out from the agitator uh, would be passed through screens and magnetic separator to remove, you know, bigger flokes, etc. Or you know, agglomerates, etc. They are still there even after you know enough blunging and then agitation. Okay, so, they would be removed by the screens and then if the clay or flint or feldspar is having any kind of uh, magnetic impurities or having an impurity which is having magnetic property, they would be removed by passing through this uh, slurry through a magnetic separator. So, magnetic particles would be or uh, particles with magnetic properties would be attracted towards the magnet and then remaining of the slurry will pass to another agitator where further agitation will take place so that to make sure you know uniformity or a denser kind of a slurry you can get. This slurry will be passed through filter press, pressure filter so that to remove water as a waste water because this water cannot be reused and then it is not having any dangerous chemical so probably it can be discarded as it is. Right. So, then after removing the water whatever the wet filter cake is there, pressure filter cake is there. So, that is taken to a extruder. Here this extruder is doing a part of you know de-airing duty also because it is having you know vacuum provision also. De-airing is very much important as I already mentioned because the, the air is being occupied between the particles of the slurry. 
or interstitial spaces of the slurry which is having you know up to 30 to 40 percent of the void volume. So, that much you know void uh, voidage is there. So, then product that you are going to get would be very porous and then will not have the required structure. So, that is the reason de airing is required before passing this material through extruders to get a definite shape and size of the product. Right? So, the de airing would be done by applying the vacuum. Once uh, vacuum is applied and de airing is been done, so then material will be passed through extruder to get a definite uh, shape and size of this product. Right? So, this clay mixture having definite shape and size that will be passed through a bat maker followed by jigger wear. Here jigger wear where you will be making the shape of the material you know product, whichever product you wanted to make. Let us say you wanted to make a plate. So, plates would be made here in the jigger wear and then those would be passed through a dryer and then it is tested further. If it is, if it is found good, so then it will be taken as a formed wear. Otherwise, you know it will be sent back to bat maker. Okay? So, this is the uh, forming process uh, or jiggering of uh, dinner plates. Now, another forming process we see which is nothing but jiggering of slip cast art wear because art wear, laboratory wear, etc. for that purpose this slip cast method is applied. Okay? So, more or less it is similar only, only that molds etc. are uh, molders etc. are coming into the picture, how to util utilize them that is what it is important here. So, the flow chart is provided here again. So, here whatever the raw materials, clay, flint, felspar, etc. are there along with the water they and then defloculin they are taken into a ball mill. Ball mill is also like a uh, cylindrical vessel, right? So, it will be rotating, it will be rotating in a particular direction, right? So, in this mill what you do? You take balls. Now, here it is ball, yesterday we have seen pebble mill, so there we have pebbles. So, here balls of different material like you know it may be wooden ball, it may be metallic ball depending on the application. These balls would be of different sizes also, there, there would be bigger balls, there would be smaller balls, medium size balls, etc. would be there. So, this mixture here whatever is there that is coming in like you know raw materials, water and then the floculaging agents are taken here and then this rotates. This rotates at the a speed less than the uh, critical velocity. Critical velocity is the one at which centrifugal force generated because of the rotation of the cylinder is balanced by the gravity force experienced by the material that is present in the cylinder. So, why it is required? If you are operating at the speed more than this balance, then what happens? The material would be rotating along with the uh, periphery of the cylinder without being uh, contacted. So, that is the reason it is required. So, when it uh, rotates at a velocity less than the critical velocity or critical rotational speed of the uh, machine, so then moment this material let us say moves up while rotating, then because of the gravity they fell down. When they fell down, impact will taking place, some kind of grinding would also be taking place. So, because of that one not only size reduction, breaking of the flocculants etc. may also be taking place. So, then uniformity of the product will increase. Right? So, this slurry coming out of the ball mill would be taken to next level that is passing through screens and magnetic separator. Again the screens let us say even if you having defloculant agents and then processing this mixture through ball mill, still if you have any uh, lumps or you know uh, floculants etc., they will be removed by the screens. And then if the raw materials if at all they are having uh, you know particles of uh, magnetic nature, so then they will be separated by the magnetic separator. After this, uh, the slurry would be taken to a agitator where aging and storage will take place. Now, this slurry can be taken to different types of molds, right? Let us say if, uh, these molds are there, you know, you know, in that one the material is taken. So, these molds would be having a, a structure. Let us say if you wanted to have a mug, if you wanted to have a mug like this, so inside this structure would be, you know, molds would be like that, you know. Uh, you know vacant space of uh, uh, mug shape would be there. So, when you uh, take this slurry inside this mold, so then this vacant space you know occupied by this uh, slurry, right? So, after some time what happens? It will be dried and then 
when you open the mold so then you can have a material of shape like mugs like this right they will be further dried in a dryer and then if at all glazing is required they will be uh, uh, glazed in a, by a spray glazing and then they will be taken to dryer and then kiln for a proper vitrification and firing okay so empty molds may be taken the similar way and then here again you can do slip casting so empty molds you do here and then you make a similar kind of uh, process you can do here and then you can get the similar kind of products and then you have this one also these are usually used for the artware kind of products and then laboratory uh, wear kind of ceramic products this method is used okay so now a few steps of uh, jiggering process that we have already discussed is presented here in the form of text mass production of simple round objects like cups saucers and plates is carried out economically by jigging in this process plastic clay plastic clay is the one after you know removing the flocculants and then uh, removing the magnetic particles etc or uh, materials having magnetic characteristics once you remove them then uh, drain out the waste water in filter press then whatever the cake that you are having wet cake is nothing but the plastic clay and then it is in a condition that in a moldable right or workable condition so right? that clay is pressed into or on a single revolving mold potter often being aided in shaping the outer surface and in removing excess clay by a lever revolving mold is lowered over the mold shaped in the profile of the object desired as shown in the flow chart mechanical jiggers have been developed however high energy mixing and then rapid infrared drying are necessary in successful automation after drying whiteware may be fired in three ways common method is to fire to a sufficiently high temperature to mature the body body is nothing but the product uh, before glazing let us say you are trying to make a mug so that mug is the body you know before glazing so this body would be glazed if required glazing is important in white wares and particularly so for tableware a glaze is a thin coating of glass melted on to the surface of more or less porous ceramic ware whatever this body is there we cannot call it a final ceramic uh, product because this has to be glazed because this product is even if you do deairing and all that that will be more or less porous only right so that porous nature uh, has to be you know controlled or reduced by doing a glaze coating when you do a glaze coating the material will become almost almost non porous by glazing that's the reason glazing is very much important this glazing contains ingredients of two distinct types in different proportions refractory materials such as feldspar silica and china clay and then fluxes such as soda potash fluorspar and borax refractory materials provide thermal stability chemical stability whereas the fluxes they reduce the reaction temperature as well as the vitrification temperature further they also you know fusible so they keep material binded together okay whatever the clay mixture clay feldspar and then sand mixture are there if you wanted to keep them binded together these fluxes are very much essential because these fluxes they get fused a temperature around 809 degree 900 degree centigrade and when they become fused they will keep the material binded together different combinations of these materials and different temperatures at which they are fixed give a wide range of texture and quality nepheline cyanide permits firing at lower temperatures as well glaze must be bonded to the ware and it is and its coefficient of expansion must be sufficiently close to that of ware or the body to avoid defects such as crazing and shivering while you do vitrification or firing in kilns glaze may be put on by dipping spraying powdering or brushing so but however when you apply any of these methods the products often either over glazed or under glazed 
glossed firing is the technical term for firing of uh, glaze and then earthenware should be glazed between 1050 to 1100 degree centigrade, whereas the stoneware should be glazed between 1250 to 1300 degree centigrade. Now we talk about structural clay products. Structural clay products in the sense making some kind of bricks etc. like you know uh, for the construction or face bricks etc. so that a proper structure of requ requirement can be made. So, since they are used for making uh, structural constructions they may be produced for, from the impure clay itself uh, which is uh, which may be a low, considered as a low grade clay. Even the low grade uh, clay can also be utilized to make such kind of products. These are low cost but highly durable products including building brick, face brick, terracotta, sewer pipe and drain tiles etc. are uh, you know prepared or come under the structural K products category. These products often manufactured by using cheapest of very common clay raw materials. Such clays which generally carry sufficient impurities are used so that they provide needed fluxes for binding fluxes not only reduce the reaction temperature and then vitrification temperature the, but they also provide required binding because when they fuse they, they um, uh, keep the materials binded together because of their fused nature. These products may be with or without glazing. Glazing is nothing but a coating which is fusible. Then severe pipe or drain tiles are often uh, glazed products. This may be done by throwing salt or salt glaze upon the kiln fire. When we do firing in kilns, you know what you do? Some kind of salt is thrown, right? So by that one, you know glazing would be done. So since it is done by throwing salt, so this glazing method is known as the salt glaze. Volatilized salt reacts to form fusible coating or glaze. Now we talk about manufacturing of building brick. Clays from three groups are used as raw materials. These are nothing but red burning clay, white burning clay and buff burning clay which is usually a refractory. Requirements for face brick include several stringent conditions like, uh, such as no warping, no soluble salts should be there and then sufficient hardness should be there when burnt at moderate temperature. Uniformity in color upon burning should be there. So, such kind of requirements are there for the face bricks. However, for the uh, construction uh, bricks, other kind of bricks, you know, uh, these conditions or requirements are less stringent and red burning clay is often used for the making of uh, construction bricks or building bricks. Three processes are available for uh, bricks manufacture also. What are they? They are nothing but soft mud process, stiff mud process, dry press process. Okay? So, we will be discussing about uh, stiff mud process, what it is. Stiff mud process in the sense it will be having only limited water, it will use only water of up to 12 to 15 percent so that to you know make a uh, the raw materials mixed together. For that purpose only it is used. Soft mud process, it contains much uh, you know uh, slurry you know kind of thing which is having more water. Dry press process where more or less you know we do not have any water by the mixing and then dry processing would be done to get such kind of uh, bricks. Okay? So, however, uh, stiff mud processor is very famous so that we are going to discuss now. Stiff mud processor. It is the most predominant method that is followed nowadays to make uh, bricks or construction bricks and described in flowchart in the next slide anyway. In this process, the clay is just wet enough by having 12 to 15 percent to stick together when worked. Then wet clay is forced through an extruder of specified shape and size selected as per brick requirements. These extruders as expected they should be uh, having provisions of a vacuum so that to de-airing can be done. In order to increase the workability, plasticity and strength of undried brick, de-airing is carried out and is accompanied by reducing the voids by providing vacuum in the extruders 
So, when you do the DA ring, not only the uniformity and then uh, strength, but also workability and plasticity increases for the undried ceramic product. Here, uh, in this case, undried brick is the product. Bricks then may again be repressed to make face bricks if you are uh, trying to have the face bricks. But when you do this uh, uh, repressing, what happens? The shape will become more uniform and reduces internal stresses while passing through the extrusion. When the material or the plastic clay or whatever uh, the mixture is there, cake mixture is there that when you pass through extruders, then internal stresses would definitely be developed. They will also be reduced and then shape will become uniform if you do the repressing of these bricks. Okay. So, flow chart is shown here. So, whatever the clay or shale etc. raw materials are there, they will be passed through screens, grizzlery kind of screens, so that to remove bigger particles or unnecessary particles of uh, different shapes etc. Right? Or you know needle kind of particles etc. All those kind of things are removed here. Then they will be passed through a primary crusher, which is nothing but single roll with uh, breaker pins shown here. So, breaker pins in the sense here this is again it is having a cylindrical uh, vessel and then inside the internal periphery of the cylinder what you have you will be having pins which will be you know interacting with the material that is coming in when this rotation when rotation of this you know crusher takes place. So, then when this uh, impact uh, when they inter interact with each other uh, when the material uh, come in and then rotate. So, on the rotation they will interact with this uh, breaker pins and then size reduction uh, will take place or you know uh, breaking of flocculins would take place. That material will be taken to a storage. If required that would be passed through uh, secondary crusher which is nothing but uh, dry pan crusher uh, that is you have a pan kind of system on, on that material is coming in and onto the material crushers are being rotated. Okay, so that you know reduction will take place. So then material after this step, secondary crusher step will be passed through screens again to check if at all oversizes are there. So those oversizes would be sent back to the crusher again and then desired material will be taken to the subsequent storage vessel, hopper or silo and then this material mixed with water and sent to a extruder and then uh, in the extruder they would be mixed properly or before sending into the extruder they will be mixed together and then sent to the extruder. Here the uh, de airing would be done by applying the vacuum and the material you know pass through the extrusion and then after coming out the extrusion cutting is done as per the uh, required size and shape of the brick. Extrusion, extruder shape is also in a way such a way that you know the shape of the brick that you want. Okay? Cutters is applied to cut them into the pieces, smaller pieces as per the size. Shape is uh, made in the extruders or while the material passing through the extruder the shape is developed and then size is reduced by the cutter by cutting into the smaller pieces as per the requirement. So then such smaller size reduced bricks they should be dried. Okay? Drying can be done uh, in uh, various approaches. Three most important approaches are in outdoors, sheds or tunnel dryers. After drying these are fired in kilns from a temperature of 875 degree centigrade to 1000 degree centigrade. However, combined dryer and kilns are also being developed recently. Stiff mud process is used for making almost every clay product including all types of bricks, sewer pipe, drain tiles, hollow tiles, fire, fireproofing and terracotta. In some cases from a bank clay can be directly worked into the stiff mud machine to get the required bricks but you know whatever the product that you get by this way will not have sufficient uh, strength and uniformity. So then what you have to do? If you do, you know, uh, the clay is grounded in a proper size and shape and then, uh, you know, size reduced and then screen and magnetic suppression, mixing with water, deflocculation agent, etc. All those steps whatever we have discussed. So if you follow all those steps 
and do the temp required tempering before making bricks in a stiff mud machine, you know that product would be good. However, the clay directly that you get from the bank that can also be used anyway. Okay? So, but that depends on the requirement and applications. Type of clay locally available determines the ceramic product that can be made economically or not. Finally, structural clay product manufacture has become highly mechanized. Earlier these were made manually uh, especially in uh, several countries including India also, but nowadays uh, these bricks have become or brick manufacturing have become highly mechanized. So, thus unmodernized plants may not remain competitive. So, this is all about uh, manufacturing of white waste and structural clay products. The references for today's lecture are provided here. But however, the entire uh, lecture slides are prepared from this reference book. Thank you.